we do place our hope tonight in Jesus Christ. We confess our desperate need for him. Please, oh God, please work now in your people through your word. I pray that you would allow us tonight just for a moment to have a glimpse of the transcendent reality that you, oh God, have created us, that you love us. You have a city of New York, what they're worried about is a rush back in of COVID-19. And the article had story after story of individuals who are very concerned or scared about both their physical and especially their mental, emotional health. They're worried about another lockdown. They're worried that their world will be shut down, that they'll lose their business, that they'll, their, their kids won't be able to go to school, that their churches won't be able to meet, all of those kinds of things. And I suspect everyone in the room has at least thought through those possibilities, Right? I mean, if you're a student right now, you probably have worked through in your mind, okay, what happens if they shut this thing down again? Uh, I know as a pastor of the church, I have definitely thought about this. When I saw the first shutdown coming, I was very concerned about the church. I was concerned about the church throughout the shutdown, but I was also very concerned about the church coming back out of the shutdown. Would the church in America as a whole, would our church, how would we survive these things? And this article was talking about a family who the, the wife is very concerned because her husband has lymphoma and he's in the midst of chemotherapy, so his immune system is weaker. And so he's been able to get outside some in the warm weather by going out on their back porch and things like that. But now that winter's coming, those kinds of things, are they're, they're afraid are gonna go away. And so the, the, how do you deal with the misery that might be coming? How do you deal with a life that may turn really sharply and to even greater stress than what's already here. Well, the last year in my life has been incredibly stressful. And just thinking through some of these moments where at times life feels a bit like the writer of Ecclesiastes who opens this uh, text with the phrase, with the following phrase. I'm going to read from the NLT, okay? So uh, I, the NASB is good too, but I'm going to read from the NLT. He says, these are the words of the teacher King David's son who ruled in Jerusalem, everything is meaningless. Wow, how about that for the opening to a book? This is a book of the Bible, a moment of encouragement. Let's read from the Bible. Turn to the Bible. Let's turn in Ecclesiastes. Oh, everything is completely meaningless. You're like, dude, I can turn on the news for that. I actually don't need a lot of help with this one. I can turn on the news. In fact, he goes on to say, uh, what advantage does man have in all of his work which he does under the sun? Well, for some of you guys who are near retirement, this is, this is even more depressing. You're like, man, I've been working really hard. I'm about to get to retirement. He goes, yeah, well, a generation goes and comes, but the earth remains forever. In other words, whatever work you've been doing, whatever you've been doing to alter the course of human history and the course of the world and the structure of the, wherever you are, this is all gonna go away. It's all gonna evaporate. Five and six, also the sun rises, the sun sets. It hastens to its place to rise there again, blowing toward the, north, uh, toward the south, then toward the north. The wind continues swirling along in its circular course. The wind returns. The whole idea here is that really he wakes up every single day and goes, ah, the sun came up again today. I did all my work, got done with the day, the sun set, and I'm gonna get up and do it all over again tomorrow. And he's overwhelmed with this sadness, sense of sadness. And, uh, and you wonder about this, this kind of fatalistic idea. I, I was thinking about the words from uh, the, the famous mathematician, atheist, Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell, British mathematician. Uh, he was an atheist. He since died, so he's not anymore. But he was once an atheist. And, and this is what he said. Here's what he said. Uh, the, that man is the product of causes which have no prevision, not provision, prevision. In other words, no advanced thought, no prevision of the end they were achieving. 
In other words, that, that we're just a product of accident. And this wasn't someone thinking out, okay, if we put humans here, put them on this planet, here's going to be this, that we're just an accident. That's what Bertrand Russell's talking about. He says the provision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes, his fears, his loves, and his beliefs are all but the outcome of accidental cult collation of atoms and that no fire no heroism no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave boy he'd be fun to have at christmas parties that all the labors of the ages all of the devotion all of the inspiration all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction by the vast death of the solar system and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be burned beneath the debris of the universe in ruins and he concludes with this, all things, I'm quite, if, if, he says all these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. So Bertrand Russell is absolutely convinced there is no afterlife, there is nothing to this world of any meaning or purpose. The universe is an accidental collision of atoms. And here's what he says, only within the scaffolding of these truths. Now I want you to hear what he says because I think he's actually right if he's correct about his theology. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. In other words, the only way we're going to make any uh, progress in this world is to wake up tomorrow and just realize this is all meaningless. There is nothing to this life. And I want you to know, Bertrand Russell's right, by the way. If he is right about the nature of the universe, that there really is no God and you are purely a cosmic accident, that you are just a grown-up germ that climbed fortuitously out of the slime millions of years ago. I want you to know that if that is the case, that no amount of human achievement, no amount of education, no amount of occupation, no amount of family, career, money, retirement can fix the fact that when you die, you go back to this cosmic accidental world, in which case uh, the next generation comes along until eventually they all die off and the solar system dies off and in the end, nothing really matters. If Bertrand Russell is right about the world, he's actually right about this, uh, that, that there really is no purpose and there is no meaning. And no effort to concoct meaning will fix that. Well, that's depressing, isn't it? That's a depressing thought. You wake up tomorrow and acknowledge, well, man, I, I guess Bertrand Russell's right. But here's the thing, though. It, it wars against everything we do every day. Every single day we get out of bed as if it does matter. Every single day we get out of bed as if there's some purpose to this. You didn't come here tonight because of some cosmic accident, at least not from your perception. There's something deeper and greater is going on than that. So a realization here of the significance of these ideas, these philosophical ideas are not just things to be you know, batted about in the midst of a, a, an academic world, in the academy at Harvard, Princeton, Yale, or DBU, or whatever, uh, and, and you know, in the philosophy wing of the school where they kick these around. This is every single day of our life. If there is no God, this life really doesn't have any meaning, and no amount of conjuring can make that any better. But if there is a God, and if this life ends and then the real life actually begins, then we better figure this thing out. <laughs> we, we better figure this out because if you die and you're on the wrong side of that, you think this life feels like a grind and meaningless. Imagine a life separated from God for all eternity. That's so why I say no amount of conjuring can fix this. And, and it's kind of interesting, just reading Solomon here, he, he works through a series of ways to try to fix this sense of meaninglessness. He, he's working through it. And, and one of the first things he does is he pursues academics. He pursues education. He pursues knowledge and information. That's one of the first things he does. And, and it's interesting, speaking of that, one of, the, one of the world's greatest humanists, one of the world's greatest humanists is a guy by the name of Ted Turner. Humanist with a capital H. You know the guy? Ted Turner, he, he, invented, he invented CNN, right? This is CNN, right? So when I was a kid, like, man, I still remember uh, my grandmother watching. The other thing he created was the Atlanta Braves because my grandmother was a huge Atlanta Braves fan. My grandmother in her 70s became an Atlanta Braves fan. I thought it was weird. Like, I'd come over to her house, and she's talking about what the batting average is for someone. I'm like, what are we talking about? Where am I right now? I didn't know any of these people. We didn't have cable, so I didn't get... 
uh, I, didn't, I didn't get to, you know, the, the channel that carried the Atlanta Braves, but she did. My grandmother was a huge Atlanta Braves fan. I didn't watch baseball. I didn't know what she's, I'd get over there, I don't know what she's talking about. It's like, oh yeah, he's batting like 350. I was like, oh, is that good? I mean, I don't know. I don't know anything about baseball. I play basketball. But, uh, but, but my, my grandmother was really into that. Well, that's Ted Turner. You know, he came up with this huge media uh, world. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, Ted Turner says this about this hopelessness. He's talking about Jesus in, in, his, uh, in, in this article. He talks about Jesus saying, Jesus gave hope to his disciples for a future world because he could see in the Roman Empire they were never going to fix that world. That it was so broken and such a disaster. The biggest issues they had there were strident you know, battles over slavery and poverty and all these kinds of things. And the best Jesus could ever do is give them a hope for a future life. And, and in the end, uh, you know, Ted Turner's like, that was a waste. That was a complete waste. Instead, here's what he says. TV connects us all. Now, this is the late 90s when he said this. TV connects us all in one global village. I think we can now change that to social media, right? Uh, social media, internet, social media, things like that. Maybe TV still a little bit, but not as much. TV connects us all in one global village. I believe in mass communication has made us all closer today than we've ever been. The gathering and dissemination of information to all the peoples of the world is the most important tool that we possess for us to realize that our planet is the address of paradise. Did you know that? Did you know that this was the address of paradise. Seems like 2020 has been kind of screaming back at Ted Turner to say, wow, if this is the address of paradise, I don't want to see Hades. You know what I mean? Like this, if, if this is on the good end of things, I don't want to see the other. And so this idea that information will solve these problems and information will be the final cure for all this. And that's, that's actually what Solomon did. Now Solomon, who's the wealthiest man in the world this time, it says, now God gave Solomon wisdom and a very great discernment and breadth of mind, like the sand that is on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the sons of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. Men came from all peoples to hear the wisdom of Solomon, from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. And here's what Solomon now says about it as he's thinking back on his life in Ecclesiastes. So I, I mentioned in that video that I think Ecclesiastes is Solomon's blog. You know, or, you know what a blog is. You know, someone, something happens in their life, they see something in culture at large, and they type in their personal, you know, here's my re reaction to that. Here's my reflection on that. The book of Ecclesiastes, uh, Ecclesiastes feels to me like someone's blog. It feels like Solomon sat down and went, uh, now in light of what's happened here, let me tell you how I feel about it. And a lot of what happened here, let me tell you how I feel about it. And, and each chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes is him stepping through the next station of his life. You know, we have knowledge, then pleasure. He, he works through all of these things, power, wealth. I could buy anything I wanted. I could have any pleasure I wanted. I could uh, grow my mind to not know or have the knowledge of anything I wanted. All of these things he's pursuing in hopes that as he turns you know, turns the page to the next aspect, he'll go, okay, there, I've finally found meaning. But the first one he lists here in the book of Ecclesiastes is that of knowledge. And since we have a lot of college students here tonight, this is probably good. This is probably good for you to know. It's probably good for you to know that it's fine to get a good education, but if you're hoping that education will break through the life's meaninglessness, I've got bad news for you. It will make you, uh, it will give you a big debt. Yeah, and... Uh, and, and, and it, will, it will cause you to have a piece of paper that you can hang on a wall. That could be helpful. It could be. You might have a hole, you know, and uh, punch through that drywall. And what you do is you just put that diploma right over the top of that, and you can block that up. But I don't know that it's going to solve a sense of the replacement for meaningless, for the, this meaningless world. And, and what Solomon says here, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. It is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. In other words, uh, the pursuit of information, the pursuit of knowledge is actually not something joyous in Solomon's mind. He says, this, this is God has afflicted us with this. The, the, the reason we wake up every day is like, I got to read the next book. I got to read the next book. This actually is an affliction, according to Solomon. This actually is a pursuit of things that doesn't solve the meaninglessness or the hopelessness that he feels. It actually makes things worse. Well, that's, that's depressing, especially for you guys who are in college right now, spending a bunch of money on your education. Sorry. Sorry about that. Man, that's my bad. Uh, but, but, you know, this, this idea, actually, um, 
there really is a push for education, right? There's a huge push in the world uh, that we find right now is that there's a huge push for the following. Like all of the world's problems can be solved through a few, a few things. One is making sure everybody has clean drinking water. Number two, making sure everyone has food. And number three, making sure everyone has access to education. These three things. Maybe healthcare on top of that. Those four things, right? If everyone has these four things, the world's problems will go away. Well, we're as educated as we've ever been. There's more illiterate people on the planet than there has ever been. Uh, there is more access to clean drinking water actually now than ever before. I don't know if you know this, but uh, the work by a lot of groups, including people like Samaritan's Purse, have put clean drinking water in places where there was not, say, 40 years ago. And uh, it seems like, though, people aren't happier. I'm just curious. you think people seem happier today than they did 20 years ago, 40 years ago? 10 months ago, right? Even 10 months ago. We don't have to go back that far. And uh, Solomon's pursuing knowledge as a means to filling the void, to filling that sense of emptiness. He opens the book by saying meaninglessness, meaninglessness, everything, is, everything lacks meaning, nothing has meaning. And he goes, I pursued these things, I think, as a, as a, as a way of filling in this sense of, uh, of meaninglessness, this vacuum in his heart. He's looking for a way to fill that. Uh, I think it was, uh, I think it was, I mean, no, sorry, Augustine who said, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person that is only filled by God himself. And that pursuits of all other things to fill it will lead the individual feeling empty or feeling like they remain in a state of helplessness. Now, Augustine was really insightful on these kinds of things. You really peer in. And, and Augustine, of all the people about writing books and things like that, he wrote a bunch of them, and he read a bunch of them. He was very studious. But looking at what fills his life, he, he didn't look there. And in fact, the, he goes on to say this, the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon and writing this. or You know, there's a big debate on this, by the way. Did Solomon write this, or did someone write this basically pseudonymously. In other words, someone wrote it saying, you know, this is what Solomon thought. Either someone that Solomon appointed or maybe someone after Solomon's death looking back on his life wrote it. There's a lot of speculation on this. But I think Solomon wrote it. And I think he wrote it because I think he wrote a lot of the, the, the material in the wisdom section. I think he wrote a lot of the Proverbs. I, I think he wrote this down. I think he provided this insight. And I think this is almost like his personal diary. He's looking back on his life going, okay, what things worked, which things didn't? You ever had that opportunity to sit down with someone who's a little bit more seasoned than you and just get some insight from them, you know? Just kind of, hey, uh, tell me about your life. Tell me some of the things you've learned. It's getting harder and harder for me to find someone like that because I'm aging out of that. Uh, anyway, anyway, that's a, that's a different issue. But, but to be able to sit down across from someone who's had some life experiences and to learn from them, well, this is like that. Solomon, in his, in his advanced age, looking back on his life, I think is gonna say, hey, by the way, be careful about this life is basically without meaning. And one of the ways people try to fill that is through academics or through book knowledge or, or something like that. So life, I think I'd say it this way, life apart from God, life apart from a relationship with God, life apart from a walking with God is without any meaning whatsoever. And one of the ways people try to fill that is with academic pursuit. You've seen this, yes? Those of you who've been around the academic world. I was working on my, on my master's at SMU in math. Boy, it's boring. It was so boring. Man, it was awful. Uh, I had this one class where there was one problem, took four pages. And I got to the end of four pages. I wasn't even sure if I had it right or not. I went to the professor. And he's like, well, you made a mistake here. And it was like on the third line, you know? <laughs> I spent the, the remaining three and a half pages were all wrong. Like I'd missed them all. Dr. Champagne. He was the smartest guy I'd ever met. Man, he was the most miserable human being. He was unhappy. He really had an incredible knowledge. Like he could see stuff instantly. He really could. It, just an incredible mind. Like you would start talking about this stuff. Uh, I, I paid $110 for a book that he wrote. It was 100 pages long. It was a $110 book. It was this thick, like this. It was little bitty. And it was, on, uh, it was on finite difference methods to the solutions of partial differential equations. That was the title of the book. 
Man, that was a hard class. I got done with that class. I'm still not sure what we talked about in there. Uh, yeah, it was awful. And I would go to his office occasionally to ask for help. And uh, that was the only thing more painful than the class. Because he was really, he was a miserable human. He was really unhappy. And, uh, and, and the thing was, he was the smartest guy in the math and science department at SMU. I mean, like he was, his mind was unbelievably sharp. But he was really painfully unhappy. I felt bad for him, you know. Um, and so it was just a reminder that someone with that kind of mind, that clarity of thought, doesn't necessarily mean with all that education and all that training that they're going to be happy, that they're actually going to find some sense of happiness. And some of my experience in academic settings have been like that. Uh, uh, I've been around individuals who are really, really bright, but in the end were really, really unhappy. It's a trap, too. I remember at SMU, I, I, I was in that trap. You know, it's like, hey, go to this lecture. This guy, we have this specialist coming in. He's a PhD from here. He's got a Nobel laureate attached to his name. We had that one guy from Austin, physicist from Weinberg from Austin came and spoke. And this guy who'd won some huge uh, award in mathematic world, he'd proven, he'd proven pi was irrational through direct means. He was the first person to ever do it. It took an hour and 10 minutes for him to fill five whiteboards full of this proof of pi is irrational proven through indirect means. And so you're in the room, you're taking these notes, but I'm looking around going, what are we accomplishing here? Like, nobody cares about this. Nobody cares. Nobody cares that pi is irrational. But there's this room of 50, you know, math nerd, science nerd people, and they're going, oh, yeah, man, oh, yeah, take these notes. I, I get to the end of this lecture going, okay, that's pretty cool, but if we all die tomorrow, the fact that we know that pi can be proven to be irrational, what's that going to help me when I stand before God? Like, hey, God, wait, before you judge me, I just want to show you this proof real quickly. Look, look, see? And uh, there, there really can be this uh, pursuit to fill the emptiness of life through what you know, through what we know, through what we can learn, through what books we can read. And, and Solomon, just thinking about that, just said, I said to myself, behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all those who, are, were, who were in Jerusalem before me. And my mind observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge. And then he says this. And I set my mind to know wisdom and no madness and folly. I realized that this was all striving after wind. Because in much wisdom there is much grief. And increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. So actually what he found out was the more he studied, the more he read the more miserable he got. Albert Einstein, uh, which who I found, by the way, is one of the most intelligent commentators on life. I posted, I posted on my Facebook this week something he said. I didn't know he'd said this a genius. Is that women marry men hoping, to change, hoping they'll change and men marry, men, men marry women hoping they won't. Inevitably, both will be disappointed. Yeah, so, you know, that's, that's pretty insightful. He also said this. I thought this was great. The only thing that interferes with my learning is my education. <laughs> that's good, too. But one of the things Albert Einstein said is the most miserable people on the planet are those who know the most. He knew something about that, too. You know, he really had studied, and his knowledge, he, he, he had three physics discoveries in one year all three of which should have won a Nobel Prize in physics even in the last couple of decades. That, that's how advanced he was. I mean, his, his mind worked in a way terrifyingly bright. But what he found is that the more he knew, the more he studied, the more he learned, the more miserable life was. So what do we do with this? Stop reading? Some of the students are like, yes, high five right here. No more books for me. Yeah, if you're in third, fourth grade, just give up on it now. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So, yeah, some of the students in the room are going, this is great, mom, dad, I, third grade seems like enough. I don't want to wind up like Solomon. Uh, I, I want to make sure and protect myself from that Solomon character. Uh, you know, I, I don't want my mind to grow so much so that I find out that I'm increasing my pain. We should stop this studying stuff. I think the multiplication table is enough. Let's stop there, right? That's sufficient. All right, so, so what is the answer? Well, 
It's interesting how Solomon at the end of the book comes back to this. He says this at the, very, the, the last three verses of the book. He says this, but beyond this, my son, be warned. The writing of many books is endless and the excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. And here's the last two verses though. Because at this point, the book of Ecclesiastes, you're like, hey, dude, this is, <laughs> I, need, I need counseling after reading your book. You know, like you, you want to say to Solomon's like, I full out need to budget about $10,000 this year just for a counselor after reading your book, Solomon. Tell me, tell me there's something here that's positive out of all this. And this is what he says. The conclusion when all has been heard is this, fear God, keep his commandments because this applies to every person. In other words, it doesn't matter how many books you've read, how many books you've written. It doesn't matter how well you know math or science. It doesn't m- matter how well you know literature. It doesn't matter what your knowledge is. In the very end, this applies to every single person. Fear God and keep his commandments, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Ah, So see, the solution to this is a connection with the one who made us. That's really the solution to this. This desperate world, you can grow in your knowledge, and in the end, die and have wasted your life. Like we can waste our life. We can waste our life. You could get a PhD in wasting your life. You can get a couple of PhDs and and still waste your life. You can know more than anyone else in the room. I could obsess over learning more, writing more, studying more than anyone in the room. At the end of at the end of your life, though, that's not going to change the fact that you're going to die. I'm going to die. This is true of every single person, everyone in this room. Solomon said, "Here's the deal. Every single one of you is going to stand in front of God." And that's what really matters. Speaking of knowing, I I think what Solomon implies here is that the person who really knows is not the one who's been reading all those books. The person who really knows is God. Isn't that what he says? Every act will be brought to judgment. Everything which is hidden. So the person reading is like, I'm trying to find out new information. I'm trying to learn new stuff. I'm trying to find out this theory or that theory. I'm trying to learn this aspect of science or mathematics or physics or engineering. I'm trying to learn this aspects of literature or something like that. And I'm trying to study all these things. I understand all of these things. But in the end, the person who really has knowledge is God. God is actually the one who knows everything. You remember that verse in Galatians? And I'll, cl- I'll close with this verse. There's a verse in Galatians where Paul says, um, to know God, and then he stops himself. He says, rather, to be known by God. It's kind of interesting. Like, like Paul's writing about, you know, to know God, and, and, and he stops himself because he realizes that uh, it's not just about an intellectual awareness of God, but for God to know us. And you go, well, it looks like God knows us. It does seem like God is fully aware of us, like God knows every single thing. But I don't think that's what Paul's, is ta- what Paul's talking about, right? I don't think Paul's talking about God's intellectual awareness in that verse. I don't think Paul's argument there is to say, hey, you do realize God knows everything. You're like, wow, he really does. He's, he is like a giant computer that has everything stored, both past, present, and future. That, uh, that God is just this omniscient automatron that has all this information. But that, that's not what Paul's talking about when he says that. He says, he says to, know, to know God, and then he stops, says, rather to be known by God. What he means by that is not to know like you know from a book, but to know him personally, to be in relationship with him. So uh, a, a few years ago, <laughs> There was a person in our church. I, I saw this today. A Dak got hurt, didn't he? He got hurt. Man, that's not good, but he seems like a really nice guy. But there was a person in our church, and their kid was over at the children's hospital in Fort Worth. And the cowboys had come to visit the kids at Cook Children's. And so they're down in this big lobby area, and she's got her daughter, and they're getting pictures with these cowboys. And so she comes back up to the room, and she, she's talking to her husband. It's like, well, no one, no one famous is there that I knew. And she sent him text messages of the pictures and she'd gotten her picture with Dak Prescott. And her husband's like, what? What are you talking about? You got your picture with Dak Prescott. She's like, 
who? She didn't even know who he was. It was awesome. It was great. Uh, but, but just totally unaware, you know, totally unaware of the greatness. You know, standing there. There's the starting quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. And she didn't know he was. She didn't know. You know, she was unaware. She was unaware of this encounter. And in fact, she, she's like... Uh, She's like, you know, I, can you take the selfie? She handed him the phone, like, can you take it because your arms are longer or whatever. So Dak Prescott's sitting there taking pictures with her and her daughter like this and hands it back to her. And she thought he was just some run-of-the-mill guy off the, you know, cowboy roster, you know, the third string starting defensive back or something like that, not realizing it was the quarterback for the Cowboys. And so she had this encounter, you know, and so she sends this picture to her. She texts her husband, yeah, the Cowboys are here or whatever. He goes, oh, really? And she goes, yeah, I got her picture taken with some. I don't know this guy. And she sends it to him. And he immediately is like, you got to be kidding me. He's like, why didn't you call me? You know, because he, he's like, man, I would, I would have loved a chance to meet Dak Prescott in person. And here's the thing. As impressed as we are with people like that in person. You ever met someone famous? And like, ooh, intimidated a little bit. Scared to talk to them. As impressed as we are by some individuals, musicians, athletes, things like that, famous people. One day we're going to stand before the creator of the universe. One day your heart is going to stop. You know, it's beating, it's beating, and then boom. And in that moment, we will step out of this life and into the presence of the God who simply said, let there be light. And the universe exploded with light. And the issue is not, do you know him like this? The issue is, do you know him like this? And Paul says, to know him, rather to be known by him. I don't think Paul is talking about this kind of knowledge, like God knows everything you've ever done, but the, the love that God uniquely has placed upon us and the love that he's placed in our heart for him. That this takes all of the book knowledge, all of the pleasures of this life, all of the power, wealth, and influence, magnify it by a billion. And it is a drop of water compared to knowing the creator of the universe. Right now, in his presence, there's angels yelling, holy, holy, holy. And if you, through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, have come to know him, he's got your picture in his wallet. I don't know if God carries a wallet. If he did, it'd have to be really big, right? Because he possesses everything. But I'm just saying, like, like you know, he says to what Gabriel, he's like, hey, man, I'm just showing you the picture. It's Steve Hines right here. Right here's your picture. I know him. Like right now, the creator of the universe is that holy, holy, holy. He'd go, yeah, I know Steve Hines. That's crazy, man. That's crazy to think about. Like, like this, this church member over there got a picture of Dak Prescott, unaware or whatever. It's like, oh, Dak, Dak went on with his life. He doesn't remember her. Are you kidding? Like a billion pictures later. That's the difference. Dak Prescott, he's famous. And he, like I said, he seems like a nice guy. But here's the thing. Right now, God knows Steve Hines. And he just doesn't know about you like this. Like he knows you. That's insane. The God of all creation knows you personally and he loves you. So all of this knowledge of this life will one day go away. It will all melt. It will all disappear. But there is one knowing that will never go away and that is the God who made you knows you personally through his son Jesus Christ. And that makes every moment fused with everlasting meaning. All right, let's pray. God, I do pray that we tonight would find our worth and our value and our purpose not in the accumulation of knowledge, but in the relationship with our creator. We see in your word here from Solomon's pen that one day we will all stand before you, God, and you in full knowledge with everything we have ever done and said and thought, we will stand before you. And you in that moment will know what's real and fake and in that moment will expose what is good and what is evil. God, ultimately, we 
tonight, we are able to rejoice even in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of the year 2020, in the midst of a tough year, even in the midst of all these things, our hearts can be satisfied with the understanding that you know us. That you are not just aware of us, but you know us, you love us, you care about us. And so God, I pray that our minds will be filled with the wonder of what it is to one day stand in your presence. And so God, I pray you would take the mundane Take the daily grind of schoolwork and the daily grind of getting kids off to school or getting homework done or getting work done, all of these things, God. I pray in the middle of all these things that in the daily mundane task, we would see the eternal, that the God of all creation has given us good works to do, even in the most mundane of efforts. One day we will stand before you. Everything good and evil will be known. I pray, God, you would fill our lives with that which is good. May the truth that you know us and love us, may that take our shaken hearts, our broken hearts, our disillusioned hearts. May you come, O oh God, and bring us a sense of hope and purpose and meaning. Transcends time and space. transcends our academic pursuits, transcends any book we could read or write, but ultimately to know you and to be known by you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Stand as we have this song. Come today, there's no reason to wait. 
students if you're here tonight I guess you can hear me if you're here tonight there are wings and discussion next door in that room right next door so college students be sure to stick around tonight um, hey it's Steve Hines I guess you can go too that's cool <laughs> good night <laughs>